Okay. Uh, my name is Patrick Kierens. I'm with Austrade in Adelaide. Uh, and um, it's with great pleasure that I welcome you to the call. We've got two parts of the session today. Uh, this is why you're here, so thank you for joining. There are two parts to today's session that originally uh, was conceived to be a briefing for those going into Seafood Expo Asia in Singapore, but um, given the markets across Southeast Asia of interest to a broad range of seafood exporters and then an update on China, we've expanded it out. So there's two parts today. Uh, as we begin, I'd just like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on that I'm joining from today, being the Ghana people of the Adelaide Plains. And I'd like to acknowledge uh, their ongoing connection to history, to culture, to their lands, and of course their waters. Uh, and given we're meeting virtually, I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands on which you're all joining from today, uh, as well as the waters on which you're fish. Uh, as I said, thank you very much for joining the session. Two major components. The first chunk of time will be the seafood updates, uh, which my colleagues across our posts in Southeast Asia and China will deliver, uh, just giving a snapshot of what's going on in those markets. So Emilia, our trade commissioner in Singapore, uh, and then KC, Sonia, Lisa, Zung, Kathy, and Jackson, covering off a number of the Southeast Asian markets, uh, and then an update on Greater China, uh, mainland China and Hong Kong. Uh, the second part of the session will be a briefing by Laura from Seafood Industry Australia, specifically for those that are traveling and exhibiting at Seafood Expo Asia. So at that point, if you wish to um, exit the call, please feel free. No offense will be taken. Uh, if you are exhibiting, please stay on. And if you wish to stay on and hear the briefing about the show, then please do as well. Uh, I mentioned just a moment ago, I'm recording the presentation for those that couldn't make it today, we'll make it available to them. Uh, and also the presentation that you'll see uh, will be distributed afterwards. So don't feel you need to make copious notes. Uh, the pack will be sent around. Before we kick off with the updates, I'd like to introduce Laura Davies. Many on the call will have already spoken with Laura, particularly those going into Seafood Expo Asia. Uh, but I'd like to hand over to Laura, who succeeded Julie as the Trade Export Manager for uh, Seafood Industry Australia, to add her welcome also. Laura, over to you. Thanks so much, Patrick. And good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. I wanted to provide a bit of upfront context um, that Seafood Australia, your representative body, has been working on. So in August 2022, we published our very first strategic export marketing plan, and we set a goal for um, 2030 to reach two point, sorry, two billion um, by that year. So trade development activities like this really helps us to shift the dial and get there in time. So I'd like to thank everyone for their participation in um, helping us to get to that goal. So I'll pass to Amelia um, to provide the Singapore update. Thanks, Laura. And hi, everyone. Um, I'm Amelia, as Pat said, the Trade Commissioner in Singapore. Uh, Irene Tay and May Yitan from my team, you may have had some interaction with and they'll be on the ground in Singapore as well. I think, Pat, are you going to share the slide? But, but um, like Pat said, um, we're going to share these. So if it goes off at any time for you, don't stress. Um, I'm sort of not going to talk to the, the lines on the slide uh, exactly, but we will share them with you as a follow up and the sessions being recorded. So don't stress about that. Um, so on to the um, first piece. I think most of you are probably familiar with Singapore, but, you know, we're small, really import dependent market, uh, major hub for the region. So lots of opportunity, but super competitive. Um, a very connected, we're very connected from a government to government perspective. Sort of Singapore and Australia have got an acronym soup of, of trade and economic arrangements. Um, you know, obviously you'll be familiar with the 20th anniversary of the free trade agreement, uh, but we keep adding more. And the most recent one, which will be relevant to you, is 
the foreign ministers and the prime minister announced a supply chain working group that has a food pact associated with it. Now, from the Singaporean side, that's all about food security. Uh, and obviously, from the Australian side, that's about growing sustainable exports and investments. Um, so really, there's sort of two stories when it comes to food imports in Singapore. The Singapore government story is all about food security. It's a sort of, it's almost a scarcity mindset because they're so dependent on imports. 90% of food consumed on the island is imported. And this has driven, you know, policies around home growing protein and vegetables and diversification of imports sources. So both of those have benefits, potential benefits for Australia. Um, if you think about domestic aquaculture here, it's only about 10% of fish consumption. They're sort of traditional business owners who are aging out uh, and the government's looking to sort of buy back their land and think about, you know, enclosed solutions because land is so scarce. Um, typically, you might have seen them sort of on the strait between Singapore and Malaysia, but um, increasingly the government wants to move away from that. Um, the other thing is the diverse, diversification of import strategy is literally their don't put all your eggs in one basket strategy. Um, and recent shocks from the pandemic and domestic export bans, um, which is happening all around the world, but it has really um, been quite tough for Singapore. You know, some of their major trading partners have kind of accelerated this nervousness around that when Malaysia, for example, banned the export of eggs or chicken. Um, and that uh, did lead to increases for Australian exports in those categories. So food security and protecting uh, price inflation are really the key focus for policymakers here. Um, and that flows to some of the major food distributors and retailers, um, as many of them are connected with government. For example, SAT's largest protein importer for the island and NTUC fair price, the largest retailer. Um, and so the second part of the story is really, um, you know, the different part of the economy. It's the tourism, business, events, expat, food service industry, and that's your premium sell opportunity. Um, and this group is really driven by sort of quality trends, uh, and we'll talk a bit more about that. Um, thanks, Pat. He's already moved me on. But um, the you can see tourism receipts are uh, bouncing back um, and expected to be at pre-COVID levels by next year. Other good news is Singaporeans eat more seafood than the global average. Uh, if you think about your go-to-market, um, one of the two main fishery ports is closing next year, Sunoco, I'm, I'm sure you all know that, but if not, all the traffic is being driven up to Jurong Fishing Port. That's a trend in general with shipment here um, up to Jurong. And if you're in the retail space, you've really got three main players in town. Um, if you're going into food service, you've obviously got your you know, your local traders, but then some interesting models like Kalina, um, who do food service import, but then they also have their restaurants, very small premium retail outlets. Um, so you might think Petuna Ocean Trout has done well in this model. They go into food service channel and then they're also going into the retail as well. So on the next slide, you can see here we're close to top 10 overall for seafood into Singapore. Uh, and within the top 10 for certain categories, your fish, your lobsters, your prawns. But what I think is really interesting in this data um, for us to think about, and, and if you look at that um, sort of list on the bottom left and note where Malaysia and Japan sit in that list relative to us. Now, Malaysian product into Singapore beats us on price, of course. There's no transport costs that, that we have. It's often going into wet markets or hawker centres. But if we think back to that example of eggs and chicken from when Malaysia closed the borders, it did see an opportunity for some Australian product to displace that Malaysian product as Singapore continues to diversify away from reliance on, you know, sole um, source countries. And then if you think about Japan, um, an Australian seafood uh, restaurant that was opening here did some market research ahead of opening a new venue. And the Singapore consumer feedback was, Japanese seafood number one, closely followed by Australian seafood number two. That was in terms of perception, you know, premium quality, um, taste. So we're not hearing a lot in the market about um, the Fukushima water release, uh, but we are watching it um, to see because Japanese seafood is obviously such a significant part of that premium base here. So on the next slide, 
Um, I'm not going to take much time here just to, to point out a couple of things. Uh, you may all be already experiencing this in other markets. The old generation, you know, has typically been at the wet markets. Uh, the younger ones are a bit, you know, prefer the clean, easier to cook at home, um, you know, just less familiar um, with the species maybe. You know, people have got small kitchens here. Land, lack of land is driving so much of, of people's consumption. Um, and while e-commerce did grow uh, during the pandemic, we're still seeing the preference for people to make decisions about seafood or um, products that cost more in person. It's certainly a, a physical retail kind of um, country. Shopping is considered, shopping and eating are considered the two um, sort of national hobbies, essentially. Um, and on the next slide, this kind of brings me to opportunities and, and challenges. And, and many of the many of these I've sort of touched on already. Um, you know, Australian seafood is so is viewed so well in the market, and we think there are, you know, good opportunities. I'm sure you're seeing peaks in tourist and, and holiday season seasonality as well. Um, and there is a higher purchasing power here than some of our neighbouring markets, but you are competing with global brands and pricing can come into that equation as well. We saw that a little bit with our um, friends in the lobster side out of, you know, sort of North America and Canada um, on pricing. Uh, and then just back to my, my point about um, sort of cooking and eating at home. Look, one of the national dishes is chili crab. Nobody's making that at home. Everybody's having that out and about. Um, so they're going to your hawkers or your or your big um, restaurants to have that. All right, so last one to wrap up. Um, I think you know about Singapore as a hub. Um, in some instances, they're looking to be a transshipment hub. So there might be opportunities in the future to think about you know, stock management or going out, launching into, you know, other markets from here. Um, but if you're thinking about the competition in the market, that's when the USP, the unique selling proposition really comes into it. Uh, Singaporeans are really brand obsessed. Um, but when you're sort of selling into the buyers, thinking about quality, price, certainty of capacity and supply, um, how do you target an Asian consumer? You know, how do your products fit with that palette? Um, and then thinking about how you can demonstrate your track record, sort of big restaurants and chains in Australia are so well known here. So if you talk about one of your customers in Australia, it, that's a big sort of at the big end of town, they're often known here and that really helps, helps as well. Um, and then just on relationships, um, they matter. It's such a small market. Irene, uh, one of our fabulous BDMs, tells me, look, you can only have one wife on the island. It's such a small island. Sorry, that's my phone ringing, which is inconvenient. Um, so where was I? Something about wives. So basically the point is everybody talks to everybody. So if you want to change suppliers, that's fine. But make sure you tidy up your business and you have those conversations first before you're going into a new distribution um, a channel or partner. Not saying don't do it, but we have seen sometimes just a, a negotiated conversation with a current distributor about why aren't I growing or what channels am I going into? And we're happy to help with that rather than jumping to talk to somebody else and then everybody finds out because they're all talking to each other. Um, so that's something that we're really happy to help you with. So I think I'll leave it there and I'm handing over to KC, I believe, from Malaysia. Thanks, KC. Thank you, Amelia. Hi, everyone. So I'm KC from the Kuala Lumpur Post. Uh, great to speak to all of you. Uh, so just let me give you a quick overview around Malaysia before I pass it on. So uh, Malaysia is a middle-income nation with, and it's one of Australia's largest trading partners in Southeast Asia. Um, and also Malaysians are very well known for our love of food. Uh, one thing to note about the geography of uh, Malaysia, uh, that is the East and West Malaysia side. So East, uh, East Malaysia would be the Borneo uh, bit that's next to Brunei. And West Malaysia is the bit between Thailand and Singapore. Both uh, sides have different distributors and importers, and they have their own uh, way of uh, distribution as well as uh, retail. 
so if you're trading through Malaysia, do keep uh, keep in, keep that in mind, especially if you're nominating and importers as an exclusive distributor, because they may not have the capacity on you know one side or the other. Um, one one thing about Malaysia and Australia, you know, uh, there's a strong people people connection. One example would be Master Chef Australia season two. Adam Liao is currently in Penang, celebrating the 50th sister city relationship between Adelaide and Georgetown in Penang. He was born in Penang and grew up in Penang. What that means is that brand Australia is strong. Uh, produce is uh, uh, usually noted uh, for their Australian stores and tends to bring additional marketing and promotional value. So like Australian beef, Australian coffee, Australian honey, et cetera. So retail supermarkets tend to be the main source for imported seafood for consumers, as well as Hareka. And local distributors and importers tend to be the main channel for seafood into, uh, into these um, outlets. Um, E-commerce has also shown strong growth of, over the last few years, especially during the pandemic. Uh, importers and retailers have also have gone into delivering of seafood and has cold chain uh, support in the last half of the side of it. Um, so around the current trend, Horeca is recovering from the pandemic. You know, new wave of Horeca uh, serving you know, menus using high quality premium ingredients as well as new generations of uh, chefs. Um, there is some growth in the frozen and processed seafood products by customers speaking more convenient. Uh, we started having a couple, not a lot, but just a couple of inquiries around sourcing Australian seafood, especially around the is uh, issue in Japan. Um, so I guess uh, to let you know, like the strong opportunities here is basically brand Australia itself. As, uh, and the, the other bit is basically Australia's proximity to Malaysia, uh, giving us a logistical advantage. Malaysia is also one of the largest e-commerce market in Southeast Asia, and last month delivery is fairly well done. Uh, and there's also opportunities that uh, for growth in the food, uh, food manufacturing side, uh, as Malaysia aspires to be the halal hub, gateway, and re export platform to the Muslim world. Um, some challenges for the market, of course, there is uh, some trade barriers, and uh, you know. Uh, specific certifications that's required for Malaysia imports. Um, if you're looking into the food service and manufacturing side, the halal certification process may be an issue, especially if you are reprocessing it before export. And also because it's an open market with international imports from competitor countries, as well as domestic production price point, is a, a price point as well as the way of processing certainly is uh, something that you need to be aware of uh, while you're talking to people. So that's pretty much for, from me for Malaysia. Uh, now I'm handing it over to Sonia in Jakarta. Thank you, Casey. Hi, everyone. I'm Sonia, um, Australia Jakarta BDM, and it's a pleasure for me to share with you today on Indonesian seafood market briefly. Um, as may you all might already know, Indonesia is an archipelago and a maritime country. Um, and the country also produces quite a lot of seafood products and also exporting to several countries such as USA, China, Japan, Vietnam, Malaysia, Taiwan, Singapore, and several others. In 2021, Indonesia produced uh, 21.8 million metric tons of seafood products mostly produced by the aquaculture industry. Uh, seafood production in Indonesia are including tuna, baramandi, shrimp, tilapia, catfish, lobster, rock lobster, oyster, octopus, seaweed, and um, others. There's quite abundant, um, actually, the countries are producing uh, seafood products. In 2022, uh, Indonesia total export value for, uh, for seafood was 5.8 uh, billion Australian dollar. Uh, while in contrast, the total import value was only about $772 million. Um, Indonesia is importing mostly frozen, fresh chilled uh, fillet fish, crustaceans such as crab, shrimp, and prawns, uh, mollusks such as uh, cuttlefish, squid, scallops, octopus, oysters, mussels, and uh, others. 
China is Indonesia's top supplying countries, uh, holding 19% of total market share. And Australia is Indonesia's fourth supplying countries with total value of, of 48 million Australian dollar, holding 6.2% of the market share. Um, salmon is dominating the trade, uh, complemented by abalone and crabs. Indonesia consume more than 40 kilograms of fish per capita per year, making the country one of most fish dependent nati nations in the world. Uh, the large populations and growing a few, a few affluent customers continue to increase opportunity for premium quality products. Post COVID-19 pandemics, the market continues to recover positively. Shopping malls are full with customers, especially during weekends. Hotels occupancy also recovering well. Uh, fine dining and full service restaurants reopen their premises and there are new establishment in the market as well. Customer growing preference toward convenience influence food producers to expand their frozen food offering lines that include products featuring seafoods as main ingredients such as fish balls, salmon balls, crab, uh, crab sticks and others. Food producers also offers uh, frozen seafood such as frozen fish fillet, frozen scallop, oyster, octopus, marinated seafood products to cater, uh, to cater customers' demand on ready-to-cook products. However, most of these products are manufactured using local seafoods as they are more competitive in price. Imported seafood products also subjected to quota that need to be applied by importers. So finding suitable importer partner with appropriate import permit is very important. They will assist you in complying with import regulations such as lab tests and other requirements. Despite of these challenges, uh, opportunities are available in the market, especially presented by fine dining restaurant that offers menu featuring premium quality ingredients, such as high quality seafood products as those used by Japanese and European restaurants. The challenge, however, is on the needs to educate uh, the customer to better understand and recognize Australian seafood products. For instance, a uh, Japanese chef, they tend to prefer seafood coming from Japan. However, the premium quality of Australian seafood provides a, comp a competitive attributes to compete with seafood from Japan. The recent Fukushima waste disposal event also provide additional opportunity to promote the, the safe and sustainable trade of Australian seafood in the market. Indonesian customers strong per, have a strong perception and recognition of, of our Australia as a fresh food producer and a premium quality um, producer. This presents opportunities to promote and increase the market share for Australian seafood in Indonesia. Us in Indonesia at Australia office will be ready uh, to assist you in looking for opportunities or to expand your business in Indonesia. So feel, uh, please feel free to reach out to us at any time. Now I would like to pass on my uh, the turn to my dear colleague Lisa in the Philippines. Over to you, Lisa. Thank you, Sonia. Um, hi, everyone. For um, for the Philippines, being an island country. We're one of the top producers of seafood in the world. Um, seafood is also one of the most consumed proteins in the Philippines at 40 um, kilograms per capita. Um, you can see from our slide that these are the top five source countries of seafood imports of the Philippines. And number one is China, which supplies almost 40% of seafood. Um, seafood is a fairly new sector of interest for the Philippine market. I have been handling agri-food for Austrade for a long time and there has not been much interest for Australian seafood until recently, mostly because of the price. Um, surprisingly, it was during the pandemic in 2021 that we received several inquiries for salmon export import sorry, from Australia. And once we found a few of the right customers, we started to work with them for other types of seafood. The market now prioritizes variety over price as the most important factor in um, importing seafood. Some recent inquiries we received were for salmon, lobster, toothfish, and scallops. The market does not use much abalone, so we're not that familiar with, uh, with abalone. Also, the preference is still mostly for frozen seafood and a smaller quantity of chilled seafood. 
In terms of regulation, it um, on paper it says it has limited market access, but um, institutional buyers are allowed to import seafood for hotels and restaurants. But most of the seafood find their way into most some supermarkets and retail stores also. The most common imported seafood in the supermarkets are salmon, scallops, and prawns. According to some seafood importers, the hotels and the casinos are the biggest users of premium seafood, with lobsters being offered in the buffet. Um, we will focus on this sector as we expect more um, to find more opportunities for Australian seafood in this market. Um, that's it for the Philippine market. And now my colleague Zoom Duan from Austin, Hanoi, will talk about the Vietnam market. Over to you, Zoom. Uh, thanks uh, for handing over to me. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm the Dung Duan, uh, new BDM from uh, Auschwitz, uh, Vietnam. I based in Hanoi. So thanks everyone for coming here, and then thanks Patrick uh, for post uh, putting uh, things together and uh, very closely into uh, uh, on the slides. So on the Vietnam. So today I want to send. Um, uh, some information to you. Uh, first, uh, Vietnam, as you know, last year we are the top three largest seafood exporter in the world. So we are number three after China and Norway only. So clearly because uh, Vietnam has a very good um, geographical advantage uh, because we have uh, uh, the coastline uh, of more than 3000 kilometer, uh, kilometer. So I think that is one of the advantage that Vietnam has naturally. So we could uh, utilize then the resources for the marine and to export the seafood around the world. Um, uh, shrimp uh, and uh, catfish and tuna are the top three that Vietnam exports to the world. And uh, the top five uh, importing uh, markets of Vietnamese seafood is the, the US, China, um, South Korea, Japan, and the EU. And now with uh, um, the free, uh, FTA uh, that Vietnam is signed up for, like CPTPP or RCEP, um, Vietnam has uh, increased uh, its export around the world thanks to the tariff uh, elimination uh, because of the, the agreements. So when it comes to the importation, we do import. We do import. Uh, we import, but uh, the importation volume uh, is just one fifth of the total Vietnam export to the world. So it's in, uh, around uh, two over over two uh, uh, 0.7 billion uh, of USD uh, last year. And uh, we are also uh, importing uh, a lot from India and Indonesia, Norway and China. And um, that is the, 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 the import and export of the Vietnamese seafood. And uh, when it comes to Australia, um, so we do, uh, uh, I think uh, the, the importation um, for, for Australian seafood to Vietnam is still very small, relatively uh, compared to the total Vietnamese uh, imported seafood uh, is just uh, rich uh, over 60 million USD last year. Uh, so it's very small. Uh, I think that uh, with um, uh, the coming opportunities and uh, and a, um, a more intensive promotion, so hopefully that Australia um, seafood would come uh, with um, a high increase into to Vietnamese market for this. And uh, Australia, uh, we have got um, the lobster, the three kinds of lobster, eastern, southern and western. And uh, um, uh, that is the, the eastern lobster is the latest one that we just got the market access for Vietnamese market last month in uh, um, August and now as Austrit and we are doing the promotion together with a, a Vietnamese importer to celebrate and to promote the market for this. So we hope that uh, we could uh, get a um, higher increase of the Australian uh, seafood to Vietnam in the coming year. So when Vietnam uh, imports the, um, the seafood uh, to the market, so what uh, can they do with that? So we here we have uh, 
the channels uh, for distribution and consumption. Uh, basically in Vietnam, so I guess uh, many of you here have been to Vietnam, you could easily see that uh, um, we have a very popular and typical wet market where um, the ordinary people often go there to shop every day. So normally they buy uh, fresh seafood, uh, but most of them are from the uh, from the local, uh, not imported one. But when you go to uh, the supermarket or the modern retail chains, uh, you can easily find the imported uh, um, seafood like salmon or tuna or the other ones. Yeah. Um, and also the other channel that uh, Vietnam consumes uh, seafood is uh, by uh, restaurants and the new uh, you know, new uh, seafood uh, specialty store. That means they go there to uh, to enjoy uh, the, 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 the move on the, the environment and also to test uh, the imported seafood only. So uh, that uh, and that kind of a store, we rarely see uh, the local um, uh, seafood uh, uh, being sold there. So that is the another one. The e-commerce now is on the rise of all the consumption, especially for, for the young generation. So now they uh, kind of, um, you know, like to shop online, for example, uh, salmon and they can book because they believe in quality uh, from the salmon of, from Australia or the salmon from Norway. So it's kind of they have uh, um, uh, uh, they have a strong belief in the quality, so this this go online to to um, um, to make orders. So it's very easy. So I think that with a with a number of uh, middle class uh, people uh, going up in this uh, country, so the trend of the consumption of imported seafood, especially the one like uh, that Vietnam doesn't uh, produce, is like salmon or uh, king crab or abalone or uh, lobster. We also have here, but uh, different, uh, we have different kinds of it. So here they are uh, kind of curious and then they are tending to try something new. So that is the, the trend of the consumption. When it comes to opportunity and the challenges, so we do have because we we and Australia and uh, join uh, the several um, uh, trade agreements together. So we enjoy the tariff 0%. And now the market access for imported seafood um, uh, is quite, OK, I mean, uh, for the key products from Australia, so with a um, with a, a, a consumption volume is on the rise in the coming time and together with the market access is open as I share with you the Eastern Lobster just uh, got a market access last month, uh, so it's very easy for us and to um, to to uh, to hope that uh, we can get uh, the uh, increase uh, for the imported uh, consumption uh, in general and also the Australian seafood in particular. Uh, However, we we do see some challenges for that because um, here because we Vietnam is uh, famous for the seafood uh, around uh, the country. So uh, uh, the imported uh, seafood faced the stiff competition with a local one, and and because people have more choices, and then of course they cannot buy, uh, you know, at, at the same time a lot of of things, and uh, also the competition with the other imported uh, 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 imported uh, importing as uh, exporting country of seafood like Norway and Japan and uh, that is the the the, the competition that uh, we will see that uh, um, it it, would, uh, it exists and uh, uh, we need to 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 be fully aware of it yeah and also um, uh, the challenge is now the economy not only in Vietnam but also in the whole world is uh, uh, is down and uh, I hope that it uh, it would be up uh, in the coming time and then uh, the consumption or the inflation is under control and then the consumption uh, push would be uh, a little bit larger and uh, of course then people would uh, spend more money for the imported seafood because we have uh, seen the different gap in the price between the local uh, seafood and the imported one. So when people tend to consume more and they will buy more. So that's all my part. Uh, thank you for that. Yeah. So I would like to uh, hand over to the next one. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dong. Uh, yeah. So my name is um, Kathy Chen. Uh, so I'm the seafood sector lead in Austria, China agribusiness and food team. Uh, so here is some general facts about China in 20. Uh, 
2022-23, and China's actually a simple import from Australia is a value at 39 million Australia dollars with 20% increase. Uh, so the main importing countries are Ecuador, Russia, USA, Norway, Australia, and Southeast Asia countries. So uh, China's seafood import uh, is going rapidly, uh, rapidly because China has a long history of eating seafood, especially for coastal um, residents. So per capita, um, seafood consumption in China is over 36 uh, kilograms uh, annually. And the uh, premium seafood is appreciated by Chinese consumer. Uh, they tend to place more trust on seafood uh, region, like a lobster from Australia, oyster from France, and uh, salmon from Norway. Um, so for the channels, the uh, web market, retail, and food services are traditional uh, channels. However, Timor and JD, they are the biggest uh, platform with a uh, very good reputation of quality and safety. And one third of the total sales are done online and the number expect to grow to 36% in 2025. And also the new retail business model like uh, Herma Fresh, um, they actually allow the consumer to shop from the fresh produced online uh, through their app and pick the products uh, directly in its physical stores. It actually integrates the supermarket, uh, restaurant, e-commerce uh, merchant with uh, the logistics, and it has the highest growth in the sales among all uh, chain supermarkets in China. So uh, for consumers uh, behavior, we are, uh, Chinese consumers are going quite health conscious and they purchase high quality imported seafood from uh, trusty origins and channels. Uh, their criteria for imported seafood uh, include like a uh, texture, taste, uh, nutritional value, and uh, safe and nature to consume. And they tend to shop online for imported seafood and go to well-established platforms and uh, go to their trusted retailers for more reassurance. Um, so in addition to reliable purchase channel, consumers also demand for um, convenient recipes for home cooking experience. For opportunities, uh, uh, Australia seafood has great opportunities, uh, mainly because uh, Chinese consumers' live quality has significantly improved, and they can afford uh, imported seafood as a protein source, and consumer cares about their health, um, um, and also the taste of the seafood and uh, freshness. So seafood from overseas is also considered as uh, more healthy and they have higher quality uh, control for the water. Um, and Australia can supply high quality seafood with sustainability and traceability. The most favorable uh, seafood variety in China include um, live lobster, even though now it's still restricted, um, abalone, prawns, uh, salmon, crab, oyster, uh, tuna and fish like a cod and also the um, two fish. So although frozen seafood is often viewed as convenient and safe to eat, uh, consumers' preference for chilled and live seafood as many people value uh, the freshness. So as the pandemic eased um, the, and the international trade normalized, China is likely to see an increase in seafood import uh, driven by regulatory shift. So Japan's release of uh, treated seafood, uh, treated water also drive importers to diversify uh, from Japanese seafood to uh, substitute from other countries, including Australia. Uh, for challenges, uh, we still have some market access uh, issue and um, bilateral relationship also impact in last few years. Uh, some Australian seafoods are still restricted to export to China due to no protocol or non-trade barriers such as uh, live lobster. Um, for compliance and regulation, uh, Exporters should uh, familiar themselves with uh, Chinese import regulation and food safety standard to ensure the imported seafood products comply with the Chinese uh, labeling and packaging standard. And uh, at the moment, Australia is also uh, receiving some competition from other countries like Russia, Southeast Asia, Ecuador, on, and Norway. Uh, regarding some tips of doing business in China, social media is quite uh, important because importers tend to invite food celebrity to conduct seafood tasting and live streaming through the platforms like WeChat, uh, Weibo, and Douyin. So we suggest exporters to um, conduct the market research to understand the Chinese seafood market, identify the Chinese demand, uh, consumer preference, and price expectation, and also align with the compliance and regulations in China. Um, providing transparent information about traceability and um, uh, sustainability is also, is also essential. 
Um, the other ele element is partner with the importers and distributor, identify reputable importers and distributors in China and in establish very good um, network with them. Uh, last but not least, uh, optimize your packaging and labeling. Uh, prepare bilingual marketing material before entering into uh, China market. Uh, that's all for my uh, briefing. And now I'll hand over to Jackson in Austria, Hong Kong. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Kathy. And hi, everyone. This is Jackson from uh, Austria, Hong Kong office. And uh, nice to meet all of you here. And uh, I believe that some of you have been uh, exporting to Hong Kong already for a long time. However, I'm not sure if you know that Actually, over 90% of the seafood in Hong Kong are uh, imported from around the world. So it is a uh, coastal city. Um, in last year, uh, 2022, there were approximately um, 4.5 billion Australian dollar value of seafood were import and uh, Australia ranked the fifth largest exporter to Hong Kong, followed to uh, mainland China, uh, Japan, Norway and uh, Vietnam. Um, the lobster abalone, um, Salmons and uh, prawns from Australia are very popular in Hong Kong and have a very good reputation in Hong Kong market. So um, Hong Kong is an uh, accessible market with a uh, very transparent and open um, import regime. So the uh, food and beverage products can be import easily with no general tariff and uh, the variety restrictions. And and seafood is very essential to uh, local people's daily diets. Um, according to the reports from uh, the United Nations, each person in Hong Kong consumed 66.5 kilogram uh, of seafood per year, which is uh, three times more than the average number of the world. So we love seafood and we can buy seafood easily from uh, different channels such as the uh, wet markets, um, supermarkets, specialty um, retail stores and also the uh, online platform as well. So especially the, for the new generation uh, like me, uh, we prefer buying the seafood from uh, supermarkets and also the um, online platforms because of the better accessibility and uh, hygiene. So um, customers in Hong Kong are conscious of uh, environmental protection and uh, food safety as well. They will prefer buying seafood from a reliable origin, which can supply clean, uh, fresh and traceable seafood. Uh, in fact, uh, the sustainability is one of the key values of many restaurant groups and hotels. Um, it is quite common to see um, the hotels and restaurants are putting and using the sustainable seafood and also also other food products for their menus, and this is making it an excellent destination for Australian exporters. And um, also, as you may know, at uh, Cantonese cuisine, renowned for its delicate flavors and emphasis on freshness, uh, place seafood in high demand. Um, this absolutely provide opportunity for Australian seafood exporter to cater to Hong Kong's discerning uh, consumers. Um, actually, last week, uh, the Hong Kong government announced the uh, suspension of seafood import from uh, 10 prefectures in Japan. So uh, some importers and retailers are keen to look for the uh, substitutions of uh, Japanese seafood. And uh, we do receive the inquiries about the Australian seafood and so we will keep a uh, close watch on it. However, uh, despite the above uh, favorable market conditions, uh, it is crucial for exporters who face the challenges in Hong Kong. Um, as a result of the low import barrier, exporters have to face the intense competition with the other countries such as uh, Vietnam, the Philippines and uh, Indonesia as they are having the competitive advantage on price, uh, which benefit from the lower logistic and uh, processing costs. Um, Hong Kong is home to many seafood suppliers as well as uh, the international players or compete for a share of the markets. So Australian exporters must distinguish themselves by leveraging the uh, country's um, reputations for strict food safety standards, sustainably sourced products and their premium quality. And uh, also exporters should be aware of the culture, cultural differences uh, that shape business uh, practice in Hong Kong. 
um, understanding the markets, displaying the flexibility in negotiations and investing time in face to face meetings will definitely uh, strengthen the um, uh, business uh, partnerships. So uh, that's all for me. All for me. Uh, thank you very much. And I, I will pass it to, uh, to uh, Patrick. Excellent. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, I don't think there's uh, it's a, rather I don't think it's a surprise to all of the exporters uh, and the fisher folk on this call that those six markets, seven if we separate great the mainland China from Hong Kong, are dominant for Australian exports of seafood. So um, we're really pleased to be able to give you that snapshot, uh, and hopefully that's given you some information on what's going on in the markets that you may not have had. So thank you to my colleagues, uh, Amelia, Casey, Sonia, Lisa, Zung, Kathy, and Jackson for that update. Now it's the awkward bit. I've got questions on the slide, but it's a bit difficult to open it to questions of those seven uh, markets. I will say, and, and Ben, your comment in chat, um, if you're working with a Trade Start advisor or you're working with a global engagement manager, uh, please reach out to them if you've got any uh, specific questions. We won't have time to get into everything right now. Uh, and through the team in Australia, we'll be delighted to help the connection with the colleagues overseas and to see what we can do for you in those markets if you need some help. Uh, obviously, those heading into Singapore, you'll see a number of the team on the ground, and that's a great chance to have conversations as well. We'll certainly make the details available of everyone that's presented today. Uh, but again, if you're working with one of the Trade Start advisor team, working with a global engagement manager, please just pick up the phone, talk to us here in Australia. We'd be delighted to help you uh, make the most of the overseas network that we have.